recovery in an exercise program is a scarce resource. Do it without a fixed grip width is a big advantage. Before you say it's science-based or not science-based. Hey folks, welcome back to Smart Simple Fit. Today we're going to be doing Smart and Simple Lecture Series, Episode 20, which is on Plateau Troubleshooting. I can't believe it's already episode 20. The time has flown really quickly, guys. Thank you so much for the love and support so far. I know that it's been well received and I've been getting some great comments and feedback from you guys. So if you're new here, go ahead, drop a like, hit that subscribe button, and you've got some catching up to do, whether that's on a weeknight evening or a whole weekend, okay? You've got a little bit of catching up to do on the previous 19 episodes. They're all useful, so go check them out once you're done with this lecture, okay? The order you watch them doesn't really matter, and if you're a recurring viewer, I thank you so much for your support, and I look forward to hearing more of your comments, questions, and feedback uh, today on this video. So, what is the Plateau Troubleshooting System that we're going to be covering? Well, this is for people who have already been exercising consistently, perhaps for months, maybe even years. And you've already seen some success, you've gotten some gains, you've seen some strength improvement, visible definition changes in your physique, you're adding pounds of muscle, it's going good, and now it's come to a grinding halt. If that's the case, this is the video for you. I'm gonna show you guys six big picture strategies, right? Big picture things you need to address within your program, where if you do that, it's gonna allow you to crush that plateau, and it's also gonna allow you to prevent or at least blast through any future plateaus. Let's dive right into it. Okay, the first category of things that we need to address is rep quality. Now, we have to break down what rep quality means because it's subjective. Well, my definition is basically this. Are you the one who is in control over the weight or are you simply moving around the weight? Are you just trying to put on a circus performance when you do your bench press or your squat or your deadlift or your biceps curl or your pull-ups? Are you making it look like you're capable of moving the weight uh, or performing the feat of strength that you are trying to do? Or are you just lying to yourself? Because if what you're doing is performative and not actually stimulative, right? If it's not actually a testimony to your capability, then you have some problems. So it's not always about a, a rep that looks sloppy necessarily, or one that looks shaky, which may be the case on the last rep or last couple reps of a hard set, especially of a higher rep set. It's normal for rep quality to break down at least a little bit as the workout continues and as each set continues. There's a part of rep quality uh, decrease that is almost inescapable if you're training hard enough. And that is certainly a level of intensity that I want you guys to be pursuing on a consistent basis. So that's not why you're hitting a plateau. It's not because your last couple of reps looked ever so slightly uh, shaky. But if you're doing pull-ups and you're just flailing around looking like a dolphin in the water, okay, that is not the best way to grow your lats and develop your vertical pulling strength, okay? And your upper back, mid back musculature, it's just not the best way to do it. Same thing can be said for the bench press. If you are bouncing that sucker off of your chest or taking advantage of a lot of sink, really, really excessive arch, lifting your bum off the bench, if you're maximally uh, you know, spreading out those hands to have that huge uh, grip width so you have the tiniest range of motion possible, that's probably not the long-term strategy that you want, either in a strength or hypertrophy context. So today's video isn't just about hypertrophy plateaus, it's also about strength plateaus and really just plateaus in general as it relates to resistance training. So is the range of motion consistent, right? If the range of motion is on a squat, not ATG, let's say it's two parallel or above, that is not necessarily a bad squat. It will get you stronger. 
at least at that range of motion very significantly. And at a great at further range of motion, it'll have less strength carryover, but it'll still improve your strength in that capacity as well. From a hypertrophy standpoint, it'll grow your glutes, it'll grow, it'll grow your quads, it'll grow your adductors. It's going to work just fine. The problem with squat depth is when at the start of your program or earlier on, like previous weeks, previous sessions, if you were squatting below parallel, now all of a sudden you're adding weight, you're adding weight, and you're shaving off, and now it's a parallel squat, and now it's above parallel, and now it's a quarter squat. Okay, you're lying to yourself about how much weight you can lift. So range of motion is a huge part of rep quality, specifically as it pertains to the consistency of the movements. You don't want to just shave off, shave off, shave off more. Yeah, you could call that movement economy, but from a body development standpoint, both in terms of strength and size, you want your workouts to be consistent. If your rep quality at the start of a program isn't very good because you're bouncing it all over the place and it's shaky and it's asymmetrical, okay, fine, you want to improve that. But once you get it to a, you know, a, a, a serviceable amount of rep quality, you want to be consistent, especially in regards to things like range of motion. Otherwise, you're just not getting an honest assessment of your own strength, session to session, week to week, or when you go to hit your big PR. Another important element of the rep quality is the tempo slash eccentric control. If someone is to look at your reps, look at your lifting footage, is it obvious to them that you are controlling the weight on the way down? Now, some people dogmatically believe that on a conventional deadlift, you uh, should not ever control the weight on the way down. Some people say you should. Some people say it's somewhere in the middle. I tend to believe that you should control the weight enough that it prevents your reps from being chaotic where like the weight rolls away and you know you have to chase after it and you know step after it and roll it around. Look, if you have to roll your deadlift, that's not that big of a deal, especially if it's the first rep. But on subsequent reps, you wanted them to basically just go straight up and down like a robot, each rep should look almost cookie cutter compared to the last. And the way you're going to do that is if you slightly control the deadlift weight on the way down, it doesn't have to be a fully centric, you can, you can get it past your knees and then basically drop it. Uh, but if you drop it all the way down, you may encounter a problem where rep consistency is hard to achieve. On the bench press, what this is going to look like is getting the bar down to your chest, you know, one, two seconds, it doesn't have to be three or four second eccentric. But you don't just want to slam that thing into your chest and not do any muscle activation on the way down and just let gravity bring that thing to your chest. No, control it. Okay, lengthen that muscle, stretch that muscle. Part of your hypertrophy gains on an exercise guide is going to be uh, derived from the eccentric contraction. Now, I'm not necessarily advocating that, uh, you know, this particular amount of eccentric time under tension is necessary for growth or this is what you know, this exercise has to be this much eccentric versus this, but the point is you should control your reps. The down phase matters. So even on, even on a biceps curl, if you go up with control, right, you do the work, you don't just drop it. You don't just get up and then go limp, right? If you go up and then go limp, you're missing out on some of that work, some of that tonnage. Now, maybe there's a point where, okay, you'd be less fatigued from doing less of the work on the way down. Does that mean you'd have more energy to do work on the way up? Yes, I guess so, but that's not necessarily a benefit. And one more point on the tempo, for the sake of your tendons, whether that's your adductors on squatting, your pec tendons on bench, your biceps tendon doing curls, okay, you want to uh, have that portion of the movement because we know the eccentric portion of a rep is disproportionately targeting that tendon. You want strong, healthy tendons over time. So only doing the concentric phase of an exercise may, in some sense, predispose you to tendon issues. Now, it's probably more likely that overall overuse and just inappropriate loading, that probably has more to do with tendonitis and tendinopathies uh, than just like a lack of eccentric work. But I'll tell you what, since we know that focusing on eccentrics can help repair damaged tendons, perhaps focusing somewhat on eccentric work is going to actually prevent tendon issues to begin with. So do your eccentrics watch your tempo, make sure your tempo is consistent, right? You don't want to have some of your bench press reps be like two seconds on the way down. And then when it's time for PR, like, boom, it slams into your chest. <laughs> Why would you do that? Okay, actually 
you know, perform how you train, train how you perform, right? Uh, the way you test should in some sense match the way you train. And if you're just coming at this from a hypertrophy standpoint, yeah, you don't have to test, but guess what? You still need to be consistent with your tempo week to week. Okay, uh, in addition to that, we wanna make sure that the uh, setup and the technique is overall efficient, right? So we're not looking to you know maximize everything to get pounds on the bar and same thing with the pull-up, but there are things you can do that are just plain inefficient, like not having any leg drive on a bench despite having your feet on the ground. Or with the squat, not emphasizing opening those knees up, even though when you open it up, it tends to make people stronger, it tends to prevent some of that knee cave, okay? It makes it a more efficient movement pattern when you spread the feet out, point the feet on an angle, okay? This tends to uh, decrease the distance, right? When we look at it sideways, decrease the distance from the hips to the bar. On a squat, if you can get your hips closer to the bar, you're going to be more efficient, you're going to be stronger. I wouldn't call that cheating. Look, not everyone has great leverages for squatting with, with uh, you know, short femurs, just overall short person, right? Squatting might not beat them up, quote unquote, so much. But regardless of who you are, if you can make your lifts more efficient, it's probably going to help both from a strength standpoint and from a recovery standpoint, okay? Inefficiency isn't always better. Yes, self-limiting variations do put you in a inefficient position, but within the context of those variations, you're still trying to be as efficient as possible. So it's, it's not always about maximizing more out of less weight. Uh, it also comes down to the context of each exercise variation. So basically, take advantage of all the elements of a movement. Dial them in, right? Squeeze down with your shoulder blades. People call that, you know, engaging your lats on the bench. Things like this are going to set you up for quality, strong reps doesn't mean you're cheating. There's a big difference between, you know, a proper lat tuck and leg drive versus a, you know, a crazy arch and, and slamming the weight into your bar. Okay, that's not efficiency. That's just tomfoolery, right? And I think intuitively that makes sense. And that basically ties into the last point uh, on compensation, right? So again, that goes with everything we're talking about. You don't just want to be compensating for your inability to perform the movement at a given load uh, and, and rep range or so on. You want to actually be able to do the thing you've written in your program, honestly, right? Honest quality reps. A lay person should be able to look at your training footage and say, wow, you did a good job and your form was really good too. Even if they don't know anything about exercise, the lay person should be able to intuitively look at it and say, that's good form. All right. Doesn't mean their understanding is perfect. Neither does yours have to be. As far, and, you know, as far as I'm concerned, I don't think there is such a thing as perfect form on an exercise, but it should look really good. Okay. Number two, manipulating the load and volume. So if you're hitting a plateau in your program, often this is the case of just not enough volume or too much volume, not enough load or too much load. And it can go either direction. I don't even want to say, you know, one's more common than the other. I think it would depend on who we're talking about. If, and this is a big if, if we were to appeal to strength standards just a little bit and, you know, look at someone's numbers on the bench press or the squat and, and other exercise, maybe even isolations, and we were to see numbers we'd expect from beginners like benching sets for a guy that are, you know, his working sets are under 100 pounds. It's pretty fair to say that that's a beginner. Certainly different standards would consider that beginner. And I think it's pretty obvious that's a beginner, right? Same thing for the squat. If, you know, the working sets are sub 135, yeah, I think it's fair to say that that's a beginner on squats. Not that that's a bad thing or that we should be demeaning to this person, but if we see them hitting a plateau that early on in their program, what you would expect is that they're a little bit load shy, a little bit volume shy. So maybe they could benefit from just adding, if, they're, if their reps are quality, right? Going back to the basics, if they're performing decent reps, even if they're not you know, squatting ATG with that weight or uh, you know, doing like a three second pause on their bench, well, if you just add five or 10 pounds more to that load, now all of a sudden you're gonna get closer to that stimulative zone. And, you know, this goes hand in hand with like failure to adhere to progressive overload. So, you know, maybe the first time they did their 115 times eight squat, it was stimulative. But the 10th time they did it in a row without adding a rep or adding a set or adding any weight, sure, it's not enough. But what do you need to do to address that problem? You need to manipulate the load. 
I would say add five pounds, add 10 pounds. Okay. There's a lot of people who go to the gym and work out and maybe they're genuinely scared. Maybe they've seen some videos or their chiropractor, their physio warned them about heavy exercises or someone on YouTube scared them out of loading the back squat heavy, whatever that means, since heavy is relative to begin with, you know, regardless of what, what you consider to be the, the true strength training rep ranges versus hypertrophy, uh, a person's capacity is completely relative from one individual to another. So just saying, don't go heavy is not very prescriptive. All right. Uh, but this is often the case. People do a set of 20 on an exercise, maybe it's biceps curls, maybe it's shrugs or calf raises, something like that, or the leg press. And in reality, they can add like 10% more weight. Okay. So if they're doing maybe 15 pounds times 20, maybe, maybe the guy or the girl is strong enough to do 20 pounds for 20 on the leg press. If they're strong enough to do 200 pounds for 20, maybe they're strong enough to do 265 for 20 at a much higher RPE, right? So just because a set of 20 makes you feel the burn doesn't mean it's hard. Doesn't mean it's failure. Okay. So don't let high rep sets deceive you. And if you're doing a lot of high rep sets, especially as a beginner guys, not that there's anything wrong with being a beginner. We're all beginners once. There is a tendency to do these high rep sets, feel the burn and think, oh, it's time for the set to end. Don't be deceived. So the next time you go and do a set of 20 on something, try it with a heavier weight. I think you'd be surprised that you're just as strong, although slightly more out of breath than you were the last time you did that same exercise with a lighter weight. As far as volume is concerned, look, if you're doing like only one to five sets of an exercise per week consistently, that's probably the scenario where there's not enough volume. Okay. If someone's doing eight to 12 sets of an exercise per week, even at a fairly low RPE, like five, maybe even less, they could and may very well see gains. So it's not always the case that volume is the first thing you go for. Okay. Address the rep quality, address the load, then consider you know, dialing up the sets. Because if this person has a tendency where they're scared of squatting heavy, benching heavy, curling with a heavy weight. Oh, how heavy should I go on the leg press? My, I'm going to break my legs backwards like a flamingo, or I'm, I'm going to get stuck at the bottom. I'm going to die. Okay. You know, we want people to get used to working with appropriate loads, even if they're not going to failure, appropriate loads that genuinely challenge them before we just blast more volume. Because if someone's content with garbage reps and not being anywhere close to failure, just blasting volume, just, just piling it on their program isn't going to solve those foundational issues. If they're load shy and they're not consistent in their reps and the reps look terrible, you need to address those first before you have any business just stacking on sets, on sets, on sets, on sets, which unfortunately is what maybe some people's advice would be on YouTube here. Oh, you need to get 10 to 20 sets, 15 to 20 sets. You're not doing enough volume. Wow, you need to know a, a lot more about a person's program before you can just say, oh yeah, blast more volume. And if you if you reasonably determine that there's not enough volume in a person's program, add like one or two or three more sets per week. Don't just double it, okay? Be gracious to your body, all right? Adding, adding more sets takes a lot out of your recovery. So go easy on that stuff, right? And of course, then there's the flip side of that coin. It's not just the person who's volume shy or, or load shy, someone who's going too heavy. And this is probably more the case for that intermediate lifter. Someone who's been working out for six months, a year, two years, you're, you're trying to hit too many weighted chin up PRs. It, you're not going to be able to keep up the same rep quality and range of motion. You've run out of those noob gains and you're trying to, you know, you're trying to write your program in a way where you're like, you're trying to keep up with however many pounds per week or however many pounds per month. And you just can't, it's not going to work. You might be sleeping six to eight hours a night, getting the same amount of calories, not partying and getting sick and all that. And you're still just not able to keep up with your old numbers because you're not a beginner anymore. Duh. It's a hard reality to accept, but guys, your progress is going to slow down. It's not going to stop right? There's really not such a thing as like a hard and fast natural limit. David Brooks for Chess News Network. I'm outside our New York City headquarters. We receive reports of someone spreading misinformation. But it's going to slow down. So the sooner you embrace that, the better. That doesn't mean each month you have to go for like one pound less of progress or anything measured and specific uh, like that. But just 
be prepared for progress in general to slow down and slow down and slow down and slow down. Not fall off a cliff, but slow down. Okay, so there's nothing cool about ego lifting, right? And if you're if you're loading too much, it's almost inevitable that you have to shave off range of motion or eccentric control or train with inconsistent tempos because you just can't perform at that level of load, at that percentage of one rep max. So often taking five pounds or 10 pounds off of someone's working sets, just like we said, start adding five or 10 pounds can be a big benefit to start boost. All of a sudden you're breaking through that plateau, right? Because you're applying progressive overload and you're, you're training in a way that actually stimulates your muscles. But either way, it can be true in reverse. You know, you're preventing yourself from doing quality reps, consistent range of motion, large, generous range of motion, control in the eccentric, sometimes just as much as taking five or 10 pounds off the bench, 10, 15 pounds off the squat or the deadlift can really improve a person's rep quality and now allow them to crush some PRs. Same thing is true with volume. You can easily do too much volume. I'm not trying to scare you guys into doing like one set a week or like five sets a week, but chances are you don't need more than like 10 per muscle group, uh, especially if those are taken to like within two reps shy of failure or one rep shy of failure, you're probably not going to need more than 10 uh, sets per muscle. It would depend on how you count it. Like, do you count pull-ups as a biceps group? Eh, maybe, maybe not. But either way, if we would consider for the chest, like bench press, obviously, a chest workout plus chest flies. And those are our only two chest exercises. If you have 10 sets between those two exercises per week, you should be seeing some significant improvements, whether that's six sets of bench and four sets of chest flies or eight sets of bench and only two sets of chest flies, you should be seeing gains from that already. If not, sure, maybe you could try 11 or 12 total, but you don't need to do 15 or 20 necessarily. All right, this is especially true at a higher PE. And it is okay to drop that intensity, right? It's okay to humble yourself more than once. You might think you're, you're ready for you know, 265 by five on squats or, or 200 by five on bench. And in reality, you'd be better off doing 190 by five or even 185 by five or six with a pause. That may be better off for you in the long run. So guys, think about the long game. It's okay to occasionally look at your working sets and slash them by five or 10 pounds. Even if your, your reps aren't really bad, if you can feel like all of a sudden session after session, you're like, grinding super hard for that last rep you're you're taking your sets really close to failure in a way that's making it difficult to recover making it difficult to be efficient making it difficult to have consistent looking reps slash some of that intensity take the hit to your ego and you know what it's going to be good for you in the long run so don't be afraid to humble yourself with those weights even if you're not doing dramatically bad reps with that bench press still consider shaving off just five pounds and working with that weight that you can handle better, okay? It's good for you. Number three, we're gonna manipulate calories and protein. I don't believe that there is a perfect amount of calories or protein to eat, but there are some trends that I've noticed. So for dudes who are really trying to get strong and or big, what you're going to want to focus on is having enough calories in your diet or enough food, enough meals, however you wanna phrase this, to gain at least like one to two pounds per month. If you're gaining less than that, it may be difficult. This of course depends on your body fat percentage and genetics, okay? It is individualized to some degree. I find personally at a body weight between like 170, 180, I don't need to bulk very much in order to make consistent gains. However, when I do still bulk at that body weight, I make better gains, especially on pressing movements that are more sensitive to those changes in calories and I think that's just because they progress slower in general than like squats, leg presses, deadlifts, things like that. But the point is, you're going to want to be gaining at least a pound or two each month. I think that if you're gaining more than three or four pounds in a month, you're bulking too much. You shouldn't have to go on massive weight transformations to bulk and cut, right? Like going up 10, 15, 20 pounds and going down 5, 8, 10 pounds is probably plenty. And you should really only be doing this like once or twice in an entire year. Okay, slowly bulk and, and maybe quickly cut and get it done with. Don't cut, don't try and cut 30 pounds, right? Like cut 
cut 10, cut 15. <laughs> okay. Don't try and bulk 50 and cut 30. That would just be ridiculous. All right. So no giga bulking, but still try and see that scale move each month until you get to that point where you're like, I'm really sick of how I look and how I feel. And I feel like I'm force feeding. Okay. It should not feel like you're force feeding yourself. That's a sign that you're getting a little bit too uh, husky and it's, you're, you're ready for a cut. Okay. Now, one of the ways you can get that, that food in you is to simply just snack and allow for a little bit of cheating. So whether that's eating out with your friends uh, or your loved ones, your significant other on the weekend or Friday night, hey, go for it. Don't worry about your calories. Have the dessert, have the, have the French fries and the appetizer, whatever you want. That's a nice way to get some extra calories where for like a middle-aged woman, it's just like, that'd be terrible advice. I mean, good advice if she's trying to bulk, but terrible advice for like if she's trying to lose weight or maintain weight, maybe, uh, depending on the circumstances. Uh, but for you guys trying to bulk, hey, a little bit of cheating goes a long way. A little bit of snacking, whether that's having some like almonds or trail mix, uh, something like that, or like, you know, rice cakes, rice krispies. <laughs> oatmeal, raisin, cookies, whatever you're into, get something in you. Not, not, not like too sugary and too much of junk food, but get, get something that's easy to eat, right? Have an extra half portion of rice or extra half portion of pasta, something that's easy to eat, but calorically dense. Have a little bit bigger of a breakfast, have a little bit more bread with your breakfast. Things like that can allow you to get an extra 50, 100, 200, 250 calories a day, which is probably realistically all you need to bulk. You don't need to like measure out 30 calories and you don't need to have five or 600 calories per day, but having some extra food most days of the week is going to make a difference. Now you train and often that's going to allow you to crush those plateaus. The number of meals per day can also be changed. So if you're only consistently getting like two or three a day, okay, but try and get like a snack at least in there that's like a meal, but smaller Maybe it just contains like a protein shake and a, and a fruit and something else, or, you know, like just have it, just have a fourth meal. Okay. Just put in the effort to cooking it. Okay. Cook foods that allow you to have leftovers where you can just pull something out and eat it, stick it in the microwave really quick, heat it up. Doing things like that is going to kind of get rid of this like laziness, this tendency that some guys have with bulking where it's like, now nah, I don't feel like eating or I don't feel like preparing the food or it's too late. I'm going to bed or whatever it is, or they get distracted on their phone, computer, video games, social life. Okay. Put in the effort to actually hitting those meals. Doesn't have to be five or six. That might help a lot, but at least four, if you're trying to bulk, at least four is probably a good thing to shoot for. Uh, maybe one of those is a smaller meal called like a snack, but either way, you need to be eating probably more than twice a day, probably even more than three times a day. And if you're not bulking, why not? Are you genuinely overweight? If you're not like five foot six and 200 pounds, okay, you don't need to lose that much weight. Okay, so maybe get down to 190, get down to 180, see how you feel, see how you look. But you don't need to cut down to like 150 just to start bulking or just to, you know, be content with your physique, right? Don't chase being shredded first and then getting jacked. You can put on a lot of muscle while losing a lot of weight. It's slow and steady, but guys, slow and steady wins the race. If you're not genuinely significantly overweight or obese, you really don't have any business main gain that you need to bulk. And are you getting 100 to 150 grams of protein? Guys, that doesn't, that doesn't mean a lot to just throw out numbers, but maybe if you have a protein shake, some chicken breast, uh, some ground beef and a stir fry. Okay, a nice, nice helping of rice and pasta, things like that, some toast with peanut butter on it, and a, a couple eggs, two or three eggs. That could represent 100 to 150 grams of protein a day. It doesn't have to be a ton of food. It doesn't have to be six, you know, completely meat heavy meals in order to hit those numbers. And you definitely don't need two or 300 grams of protein to make gains. Often I've seen people eat probably a hundred grams, I'd say, or less a day and still make gains. If they can do it, you probably can too. But the point is you want to get something that's protein dense, whether it's eggs or meat or fish or poultry, you want to get that stuff in multiple times per day. Ideally every single time you eat, 
protein shakes are just going to be a bonus. It's going to make that perhaps more cost effective, beats expensive, and it's going to make that more reliable. You're not going to miss that. So, you know, sometimes whether you're in high school, okay, your parents are cooking or maybe you're married, your spouse is cooking, whatever it is, you go to the restaurant, you're not always getting a very protein rich meal, although you might be getting a calorie dense meal. So having a protein shake regularly basically just allows you to be consistent. That's the nice part about it. It's not that it's gonna make you magically more anabolic than some guy who just eats whole foods, uh, but it does go a long way. All right, number four is addressing sleep issues. These are very real issues that probably some of you need to work on. Now, that might look like the just the average number of hours of sleep that you're getting per day. So if you're not getting seven, eight, nine hours of sleep, that's probably an issue. Six hours may be enough for a lot of people. I've definitely heard some stories of people who get maybe even only five hours of sleep and they still make great gains. But I'll tell you what, that same person who has the genetic capability and the diet to, and, the, and the hydration and the training regimen and so on to make gains under those conditions, they would still make better gains if they got an extra couple hours of sleep. It's almost undeniable. Sleep is recovery. Sleep is literally the time where your body is repairing the muscles. You can't argue with me on this one, guys. Get sleep. So if you're not consistently getting close to those numbers, right, if you're getting like four or five hours of sleep, that's why you're not making very good gains, guys. Or at least address these issues at the same time. You may be lifting too heavy for the sake of your ego. You may be blasting volume unnecessarily. You may have garbage reps and garbage sleep. Fix them all. But even if you fix those other three, if you're sleeping four hours a night, probably not going to get very good gains if you get any at all. So address that. Now, what are ways you can do that? Okay, I hate to sound like a parent, but put your screens away. Put your screens away earlier in the night, guys. Don't like stimulate your brain into oblivion and then be surprised that you're thinking about things and you're very awake and you can't fall asleep. Uh, so whether that's video games or just like scrolling on Instagram, watching endless YouTube videos, okay, put that stuff away. Try it. Try and put yourself in a dark surrounding, okay, and just unwind, just relax, okay. Just get off the screen maybe an hour sooner, and that might make a big difference. Try and tire yourself out. Maybe it's a rest day. Oh well, do some do some activity. Go for a go for a walk. Go enjoy the nice weather. Okay, do something that makes yourself tired throughout the day. If you work hard labor, you probably don't struggle being tired, although you may still struggle with sleep. So in that case, you may want to address other things like drugs and alcohol. You know it. It's obvious. I don't necessarily need to point it out. But if you're out partying and like drinking with your friends or using recreational drugs, things like that, that's gonna have an effect on your gains. As a beginner, intermediate, maybe not so much, but the more advanced you get, the tighter the tolerances of your program become, the less wiggle room for error there is uh, if you wanna keep making those consistent, nice, juicy gains. So weigh out how much partying actually matters to you versus your social life, or, or excuse me, uh, versus your training, right? Your partying and your social life versus your training, okay? Having some social life is good. Going out and partying and getting wasted, yeah, that's not good for your health in general, obviously. And it's probably not going to be good for your training regimen. So minimize that stuff or get rid of it completely. You'd be better off doing that, all right? And your social life, again, consider how social you really want to be while still meeting your other priorities, uh, your immediate family, okay, your children, your business, your job, your training regimen, and then you can start piling in some social life stuff, all right? So start to think about priorities. I'm not telling you to be any social, but weigh your priorities. All right, number five, this one's very key, although it may matter less so than the first four. This is movement variety and accessories. So basically just ways of changing up the lifts in your program. Are you over, always doing overhead press the same way? Are you always doing uh, the same vertical pulls, the same deadlift variations? Okay, well, you may want to consider including a back extension or a reverse hyper. If you struggle with high hamstring tendonitis, high rep blood flow, slow rep sets of reverse hyper may feel really good for your tendons and beefing up the posterior chain as a bonus. If you're struggling with your back overall, both in terms of recovery and you know maintaining rigidity, not in terms of like perfect neutral spine, but like a rigid spine in general on the deadlift, when you get close to those maximal weights, right, close to one rep max territory, 
you're going to want to focus on things like back extensions, maybe stiff leg deadlifts or Romanian deadlifts, things that you can recover from pretty nicely, but you know, add as like an, it's, it's an add on to your deadlift training is basically what it is. So the volume wouldn't be the same. The intensity would definitely not be the same. Uh, and maybe the frequency would be less as well, but you just want to do enough to get an effect. So just hammering more of the same main lift might not be the solution. Sometimes you can look at someone and say, Hey, you want to get better at squatting, do more squatting. Sometimes that's really good advice. Same is true for deadlifts. Hey, dude, you want to get better at deadlifting? Just do more deadlifts. But it doesn't always come down to hammering out the same variation, same intensity level, same proximity failure. It could look as simple as, okay, you're going to do more squats to get better at squatting. You're going to use the bar on your off day. The day after you squat, you're going to do two sets of 12 with an empty bar. Is that going to take a lot out of you? No, but it might actually make you neurologically more effective. You can, or more efficient, and you can uh, play around with your stance a little bit. You can learn more about how your body likes to squat. Obviously, an empty bar feels different than your working sets, but the point is there. The more you do these repetitions, the better you're going to get at the skill of a movement. The same is true for pull-ups versus weighted pull-ups, or push-ups versus weighted push-ups. Okay, just getting more reps accumulated especially quality reps to a standard of depth or range of motion, it's going to make a big difference overall. So variety isn't necessarily always what you need, but at the same time, just hammering the same variation into oblivion, eh, you might not be able to recover from that. So that might not be the best way to break through a plateau, but yes, you can certainly do lighter days and more technical work to get some of that benefit. You'll often feel better with two lifts per movement pattern. So that example of the back extension and deadlift or deadlift and reverse hyper is a great, great example, classic example. You don't have to do all three of those things and you might also do all three of those things and be able to recover from it and feel good. It's up to you to play around with it and see what feels good for your body and what seems to have a tangible improvement to your strength. But the point is, one movement per movement pattern is often not enough to really get sustainable gains and to maximize your gains. So for squatting, it might look like hack squats and leg press or leg extensions or both in addition to squat training. I like to do back squats, then front squats, and then either on the same day or a different day, do leg press. Boom, that's it. I'm not doing belt squats and leg extensions. I maybe could do some leg extensions, but I don't. Despite the fact that I don't, I get great gains. So you'll have to play around and see what works for you a little bit, see which of these movements you prefer, but I'll tell you what, at least having two movements per movement pattern works really, really well. So try that out if you're having plateaus, especially if it's specific to one or two movements that you don't like training that much and you currently only have one variation and you don't really put a lot of focus into it. Yeah, try, try out a variation. One angle repetition catches up to you. So in terms of the joints, you're going to feel stiff if you really only do like bench and no, no overhead press. The same may be true for overhead press. If you're always doing standing military press and never like a seated back support version, that may influence your, your back. Okay. I have scoliosis. So like if, if, if my uh, fatigue starts to make my reps fall apart on military press, I can end up with a sore back in ways that I really don't like. Now for you, that might translate to your lower back or just overall the, you know, posterior chain uh, and your shoulder joints, your elbows, because you're working with a fairly heavy weight. So doing a self-limiting variation with dumbbells or seated no back support might be a good way for you to, yes, get more out of less weight. But the point is changing up angles, doing some incline benching in addition to your flat benching could be a nice way to relieve the shoulder joint to not just pound it and pound it and pound it from the exact same angle. It's not that you can't just do the same thing over and over again. It's that a little bit of changing it up goes a long way. Consider the self-limiting variations like we just discussed. So incline presses, uh, no back support, seated overhead presses. For squatting, it'd be front squats versus back squats. High bar ATG versus low bar, just to parallel. Things like that. Splash those into your program and all of a sudden you start to learn, oh yeah, if I do this much of this combined with this, I still get stronger, but I feel better. Great. Take note of those types of things and start to train in a similar fashion. Train in a way that allows you to break these plateaus in terms of strength, especially long-term size too, and promote recovery. You want to feel good 
while making the gains, you don't want to feel like trash while making gains. Otherwise, you're not really breaking a plateau. Consider some machines, dumbbells, and calisthenics. If you're a calisthenics focused guy, you can erase that and put barbells, okay? Consider training with barbells. So variety of modality. Oh boy, this, this is like game changer, especially from a motivation standpoint, as your gains start to slow down and maybe small injuries start to accumulate, you start to hit different plateaus and things like that. Having some variety is gonna allow you to focus on new things. And as long as you don't change your entire program all at once, this could be a great way to make you dedicated and fall in love with a new thing and focus on that really hard and get really good at it. Will that come at the expense of other skills? Yes, potentially. But if you're in this for the long game, just doing one variation and one type of tool, that's super boring, man. So if you're hitting some plateaus, hey, change it up. All right, and the last category, these three all go hand in hand. So injuries, mobility, and weaknesses, right? So it's basically like, oh, I should be able to do this thing. I should be able to you know, add these five pounds. I should be able to do these eight reps with this weight, with this range of motion on this exercise. I know this because I've been good up until this point, but now all of a sudden, if you've got some little injuries, yeah, mobility issues, uh, or uh, weaknesses in certain parts of your body, right? Disproportionate weaknesses, that's gonna catch up. It's basically, it, it's preventing the, the rep quality. It's preventing the load from being manageable, even though it should be. So again, that goes back to, variations to strengthen certain parts of your body. Maybe it's your lower back. Maybe it's your quads on the squat. Get those leg extensions. Maybe it's the triceps on bench. Get those rope pushdowns in. If it's a case of mobility, you might want to try stretching out your ankles and your adductors, right? For the sake of your squats. That's going to allow you to hit depth more consistently and with less pain and soreness. On the, on the deadlift, right? If you've got tight hamstrings or one side's tighter than the others, for me, my left is a bit noticeably tighter than my right. So if I do get sore from deadlift training, it's almost always the left more so than the right. Um, and what that means is emphasizing some stretching, some static stretching, some dynamic stretching, doing some, uh, some lightweight, you know, deep work, maybe a deficit deadlift with an empty bar and just really forcing that stretch, but slow and gradual. That can promote that mobility and having good mobility in my mind, often leads to better recovery. Not just more efficient reps, not just better strength, but it also allows you to recover better because you don't have to compensate for the movement. So consider that, it's very, very important. And don't ignore the red flags. So if your knees have been hurting every time you squat, you need to think about why that might be. If your, uh, your back is rounding every time you go to do deadlifts, you need to think about why that might be. So don't ignore red flags. And weaknesses, well develop over time but just because you have some weaknesses doesn't mean you're unable so just because there's something that could dramatically improve on your squat or your pull-up or your push-up or your bench press or your deadlift etc doesn't mean you can't train that movement you just need to be mindful of what your weaknesses are that specific topic is a whole video of its own for another day but either way this was a long one this is the longest lecture smart simple lecture series I hope you enjoyed that. Thank you for sticking with me through those various tangents and analogies and examples. I hope you got a lot out of this one, guys, and consider these are the six reasons, right? These are the categories of things you need to address in your program to crush those plateaus for years to come. You need to have quality reps. You need to manage the load and volume properly. You need to get those calories and those grams of protein into you. You need to sleep quality and consistently, okay? You need a little bit of movement variety, or at least you should try it and see what happens and have some accessories at the very least. And of course, you need to address injuries, mobility, and weaknesses. That's it. Hope you guys enjoyed this. Take care. See you next time.